Despite the cancellation of the 1940 and 1944 Olympic Games due to World War II, after the war, stories emerged of several unofficial Olympic Games being held in the most unlikely of places, German prisoner of war camps. While few details survive, these POW Olympics prove the spirit of Olympism can survive even the darkest of times. Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the Games Odyssey, Odyssey open. open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and we love history. But most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history. From the epic and inspirational moments we all love, to the, well, the more bizarre and controversial moments, we're fascinated by it all. Which is why we are on a journey through all of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, from the ancient Olympics held at Olympia, all the way to now. All right, so we are here for a little special bonus episode of the Games Odyssey. This one's going to be a little bit different. So uh, for those of you regulars out there, you know that we wrapped up our season with the story of Jesse Owens. And we talked about how we needed to take a little bit of a break because Sarah was about to give birth to her second son, and literally less than 24 hours of us recording that episode, she ended up needing to be induced. But uh, she is good. Baby is good. Everyone is safe and healthy at home. Uh, so uh, we're grateful for for any uh, you know positive thoughts and prayers out there for her and her family. But in the meantime, while they're spending some time bonding, I wanted to do a little special episode to drop in the feed here about kind of an unconventional topic that has almost been forgotten about. And I have invited along for the discussion today my old college roommate, <laughs> David Butler. <laughs> so, hey. <laughs> David, thanks so much for being here for this conversation. Yeah, thanks for thinking about having me. I'm I'm excited about this. So, I've definitely been a history nerd before we met, but I I will say our time living together helped stoke the flames of history nerddom. So, <laughs> can can you maybe share a little bit about our experience of living together and some of the things you roped me into? Oh, man. Yeah, I, I definitely roped you into some things. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I did. You know, I had my degree at UNT uh, where you went uh, in art. And so that's mm -hmm. what kind of started it all. Uh, and I got involved in doing like living history style art. And, you know, we did that. That first project we did was the Civil War. And right. uh, that was that was kind of the first time that I had ever experienced anything like that. And uh, I remember you were super into it. My my brother yeah. was into it. Our fr our friends were really into it. And uh, I got a lot of success in class from the projects that we did. Um, yeah. We did a bunch of um, photography style projects out in the field, uh, dressed in the uniforms, had the replica weapons. Um, we kind of had our own little narrative that we were working through with those with the photography sessions. And I had so much success in that. I was like, well, what's what's next? And yeah. the 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 project we did after that was the World War II project, which was like way more in depth than <laughs> than the first one was. The first one I think was just like a night and an afternoon on the weekend or something. We did we, we did the photo shoot. Yeah, just out in a local state park or whatever. Yeah. Um, World War II, we ended up uh we, we drove all the way to New Mexico. Right up in the mountains to, and we like dug foxholes and like <laughs> out in the rain. We like lived out there. <laughs> so yeah, and really from that experience is when I started doing historical reenacting. You know, I, I do uniforms from all over the world now, uh, including Poland, uh, which I believe we're going to be talking about uh, tonight, yeah. and Britain. I mean, all of them. I do all of them. So it's it's I've kind of gotten obsessed with all of that. But yeah, that's how. It started with 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 me uh, was was in college with you, man. <laughs> yeah, I was doing it together. Yeah, I I still to this day 
tucked away in a box because my wife would never allow it them inside the house. <laughs> but I still have my my medic helmet. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and my my uh, World War II bayonet knife. Yes, I still have both of those that you that you gifted to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh man, good times. <laughs> yeah. So so this is really timely for us because in our season we've been leading up to World War II, and mm-hmm. we kind of wrapped up the season talking about the 1936 Olympic Mm. Games, both the winter and the summer games, which were both hosted in Nazi Germany. And so I kind of want to kick off our discussion there and just, you know, kind of quickly ask, like, what do you know about those games? Well, I I probably know, um, I wish I knew more. I probably know what most Americans know about it. And it's, it's that Jesse Owens was, you know, was the big, was the big story there. You know, he won, and, you know, Hitler and the Nazis were really using those games as an opportunity to show the world, like, this is why we're the best. And our race is like right. better than any others. And so, you know, as Americans, we can take a lot of pride in what Jesse did because he kind of took him down a peg or two. Uh, right. it, it's just so crazy because to think of the context of those Olympics with the, what, what happened four years later um, yeah. three to four years later, uh, it, you know, we, we can see that, but at the time, you know, I, I, from what I understand, it was very controversial, uh, Olympics anyway, because people were already kind of seeing the politics playing out. Yeah. But, you know, we had no idea the, the atrocities that were, that were coming, you know, m- tens of millions of people, 6 million Jews, uh, tens of millions, Russians, uh, so many people just are going to be dead by the next time that they celebrate the Olympics, which I guess was in 40, 48, 48. Was, yeah. yep. Wouldn't happen again till 48. Yeah. Yeah. So no, yeah, you, you definitely have an understanding of kind of where it fits into the historical context and, and, you know, the, the kind of really dark and sad thing about those Olympic games was for the most part, the Nazis were successful in what they wanted to accomplish with those mm. games, which was they wanted to generate a lot of international goodwill and frankly, they like this is hard to say, but they they were good hosts. Yeah. <laughs> they put mm-hmm. on a really fantastic Olympic Games, and that helped honestly in terms of Hitler's campaigns and mm. some of the yeah. things where he started to push the boundaries and be like, "Well, hey, let me just have this little bit of the Sudetenland." Yeah, where the other European nations kind of felt like, well. I don't know. He was a good host. You know, he really didn't seem like that much of a threat. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let's give in on this thing. So, so yeah, that's kind of left a, a dark mark on the history of the Olympics because of how the Nazis use them for propaganda purposes. For but, sure, yeah. But, yeah, so, you know, getting then into, um, into the war years, I think what's kind of helpful for us to know getting into this discussion is that um, you know, especially at that time and still to this day, uh, German people love the Olympics. Um, they were involved, you know, in the very first modern Olympic Games um, when they were excluded after World War One as a as a punishment, essentially for for their role oh, in World War One. Okay. It w- it was devastating to their national pride to be left yeah. out of the Olympic Games for two cycles. Um, so so the Berlin Games in a lot of ways were kind of a welcome back to the world, <laughs> yeah, uh, kind okay. of celebration. And of course, those games uh, we talked about this in our previous episodes, but they were awarded the Berlin games before the Nazis even came to power. So Hitler kind of inherited them and then used them as he wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. They were still the the Weimar Republic when they were Mm -hmm. awarded it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was a, you know, totally different political environment when they were awarded the games. Uh, But anyway, um, so let's kind of, I'm going to kind of hit a couple of highlights we're going to talk about here as we get into these uh, POW Olympics as they sometimes get dubbed. And, and then we'll kind of go from there. So, so yeah, during World War II, there were several German prisoner of war camps that ended up hosting their own Olympic games. Mm. And there may have been as many as five POW camps that actually did this, but there's three that we know of 
for sure that did this. Uh, so the best known ones were the Langwasser camp in 1940, the Woldenberg camp in 1944, and then the Grossborn camp in 1944. So those are the three we're really going to talk about here. Okay. And of those three, the Woldenberg Olympic Games in 1944 were the largest with 369 participants in over 400 events. That wow. People end up. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So again, we'll unpack all of that. And, and I'll say um, kind of on the front end here, I apologize for any terrible pronunciations of both German and Polish names because we're going to have quite a few of those in here. Yeah. <laughs> and just in case for any parents who are listening with kiddos, um, Obviously, we're going to have discussions of war here in this episode. So, you know, just just kind of keep that in mind if you got little ones in the car mm. right now. But yeah, so tell you what, David, let's take a quick little break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about the Langwasser camp that hosted their POW Olympics in 1940. OK, OK, sounds good. All right. So, yeah, let's talk about the 1940 POW Olympics at Langwasser. And again, hope I'm saying that correctly, but yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's no telling. There you, yeah, there's no telling. No one knows. Not even no not even knows. German people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They just make it up. Uh, so let's kind of catch up a little bit on on why these happen, kind of the history of what was going on at the time. So. Before the breakout of World War II, originally the 1940 Summer Olympic Games had been awarded to Tokyo, Japan, and they oh, were supposed wow. to be. I know. How about that? Wow. For <laughs> irony. <laughs> that is that is quite ironic. Yeah. So um, they were going to be the first Olympic Games to be hosted in an Asian nation. So that was a really huge deal. But then with the wow. escalation of Imperial Japan and them growing more aggressive in the Pacific, yeah. the IOC decided to award those games to Helsinki, Finland instead. Okay. So they were still trying to hold on to the games and kind of say, look, you know, this is a movement for peace. We know war is happening, um, but let, let's try to keep this going. It ended up being a short-lived effort, though, because then the Nazis swiftly spread across Europe, and yeah. they just had to straight up cancel those games. So backtracking here for a second, there's kind of this weird irony because, uh, I don't know if you knew this or not, David, but back before World War One, the 1916 games were originally supposed to be hosted in Berlin, Germany. Did you know this? No, I did not know that. <laughs> Wow, that is wild. Yeah, you want to talk about history repeating itself. You got wow. the the Berlin Games of 1916 getting canceled because of World War One, And then here you've got the Tokyo Games of 1940 being canceled because of World War Two. So if we could all just, just get along, then we don't have to worry <laughs> about this. Man, that's wild. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why the modern Olympic movement was founded. But mm -hmm. uh, we haven't quite learned that lesson yet, no. though. <laughs> So, so yeah, so let's head over to this German POW camp, which was located in Nuremberg, Langwasser, Germany, and it was known uh, as Stalag 13D. So okay. this camp had been built in a location that was actually previously best known as a Nazi rallying ground. So even some of the barracks there had already been built for hosting you know, Nazis when they wanted to get together and have a yeah. party, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's what blew me away is by summer of 1940, what I read was there were already 150,000 prisoners in the camp from a variety of nations. Great okay. Britain, France, Belgium, Poland, Norway, Russia, and Yugoslavia. Now, what's unclear to me is, OK, was this 150,000 at once or was this how many had gone through the camp? It was a little vague on that. I kind of think it was the latter that 150 prisoners had already gone through the camp, because from what I read, the prisoners only stayed at this camp for a maximum of two months before mm, they would get relocated okay. somewhere else longer term. So Interesting. Yeah, so I think um, I don't think they had one hundred fifty thousand there all at one time, but still, that's a lot of people to come through a camp in a very, very short amount of time. Sure, yeah. So 
one of the sources I read um, said that at the end of the war, when they actually got to go into this camp and kind of learn about the conditions, um, the reports were that this particular camp, it was absolutely deplorable. You've got Mm. men sleeping on floors, rampant pest problems, lice, bed bugs, rats. I mean, you you name Mm. it, they had it, right? Inadequate food supplies, widespread illness, especially diarrhea. Uh, I know that's maybe a little TMI, but there you (laughs) have it. That's what they had to deal with. (laughs) It is, yeah. Mm. And, you know, despite these conditions that they were living in, when the prisoners there heard about the 1940 Olympic Games being canceled, well, they just got together and decided, hey, let's just hold our own Olympics in August this year. And uh, they decided to call them the International Prisoner of War Games. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) So, again, I think this kind of shows how how much people actually did love the Olympics Mm -hmm. that, that this was something they were holding on to as a source of hope and as a source of morale when they're in these terrible circumstances. Now they had to do this secretly because there were some really harsh punishments in this camp for any kind of infraction of camp rules or unauthorized activity. And, And this is what amazes me is the fact they pulled this off like under the nose of their Nazi captors. Yeah. Because this camp didn't have any kind of facilities or equipment for exercise, like we will see in some of the other German POW camps we talk about. Um, So yeah, it's pretty safe to assume from what I read that the people running these camps would not have authorized (laughs) the prisoners to actually hold these games the way that they did. Yeah. And and what's kind of sad is not a lot of information has survived about what this looked like because it's a war, right? Yeah. Like just a lot of things kind of get lost to history. Well, and if 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 what you said is true that that you know people were constantly coming in and out of the camps, you know you got to think yeah. even the, even the participants who were in the, the Olympics. Well, then they, once they would leave the camp, you know those participants would probably split up amongst maybe dozens of camps. And right. then live out the rest of their experience. Maybe they survive, maybe they don't, and they go back home. And I wonder how many of them even have relayed this story to to people other than maybe their closest family members. And so, yeah, yeah. I would imagine that a lot of information wouldn't be able to be organized in a way to where, you know, they could, you know, write a book about it or whatever. That would be that would be difficult. I would imagine. So, yeah, no, a hundred percent. So. <laughs> Um, So the prisoners, what we do know is that they held a very surreptitious opening ceremony (laughs) on August 31st of 1940, complete with an Olympic flag that they made from a Polish prisoner's shirt with the Olympic rings drawn on in a crayon that they had or some crayons (laughs) they had. Yeah, (laughs) so the um, the flag was only 11 inches by 18 (laughs) inches. (laughs) I'm imagining. Did you did you see that episode of The Office uh, where they hold they hold like the Office Olympics? Yeah. And oh yeah. Like, <laughs> Pam made like little doves out of paper. Like that's what I'm yeah. imagining. Like they're standing on reams of paper for the on the for the podium. Like I'm imagining yeah. like something like that. You know, they just whatever they had on hand. Yeah, pretty pretty much. So um, for our metric friends out there, if you don't understand inches, then uh, that's twenty nine by forty six centimeters. So oh, wow. not not very big, very, very small here. <laughs> but again, they had to do it in secret. So yeah, I guess you need wow. a small flag. During the opening ceremony, they recited a pledge together, saying that they were holding the games quote in the name of all the sportsmen whose stadiums are fenced with barbed wire. Let wow. these Juche Olympiques de prisonniers de guerre be a symbol of the 12th Olympic Games. So, so yeah, it wasn't lost on them, this idea mm. that, hey, there's a lot of athletes out there who are just like us, and they are stuck inside of camps, and they're surrounded by barbed wire when they should be surrounded by fans, right? Yeah. <laughs> So I I don't think the moment was lost on them of what they were trying to do. So their games ran from August 31st until September 8th. And 
again, kind of like I said already, there's not a whole lot more known about these games, what sports they <laughs> participated in, since they did have to hold them in secret. Um, but we know that they happened because, kind of like you were saying, uh, stories did make it out of the camp, and that prisoner's Olympic flag was eventually smuggled out of the camp. And if you ever find yourself in Warsaw, you can go to the Museum of Sports and Tourism and see it there. Oh, so, that's incredible. Wow. I know. Yeah, it's kind of a miracle that that yeah, flag that's, actually that's survived. Yeah. Um, a couple other things have been smuggled out. So apparently um, there's also a paper medal. So you were just talking about that <laughs> that episode <laughs> gotcha. of The Office. Yeah. And I think they used, what, yogurt lids? Yeah, yogurt in, lids in and, and paper yeah. clips. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so they they made yeah. their medals for the events out of paper. Um, and and also there was a volume of poetry about the event, which was written by prisoner Theodore uh Niewiadomski. Okay, so uh, that so that's kind of where I Maybe. believe that's Polish. Sounds, yeah. So we're we're gonna say it is because it ends in ski. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that sounds <laughs> that's about usually right. <laughs> pretty indicative of polish ancestry <laughs> but but yeah so he wrote some uh poems about this and a few of those have have survived and then i haven't seen this but there is also a polish movie inspired by this event which came out in 1980 and it's called olympiada 40 so i'm gonna have to look that up i need to write that down yeah, see if I can see if I can watch that. So, I mean, it sounds like um, like you hadn't heard this story before. And honestly, I had never heard about this story before doing the research for this episode. Um, I had heard about the one of the other ones we're going to talk about here in a moment. But this was brand new information <laughs> for yeah. me personally. So, yeah, David, I think you had looked up maybe a little bit of information about this kind of in preparation for our discussion. But I think people, at least I'm a little curious, too, about, you know, these conditions sound really terrible. But from your knowledge of World War II, are, you know, POW camps kind of all equal or do we see a lot of differences between how yeah. people are treated? <laughs> you know, I, you know, there's been several movies that have been made about uh uh, Pacific camps um, from the from the British perspective, uh, right. and of course, there's one great movie uh, that that came out. Um, I, I'm sure most people have seen it, uh, The Great Escape, uh, and yep. that's 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 actually a really accurate great movie. Um, okay, and you know that takes place that, that camp had um, British American, um, probably had some French uh, POWs in it, and okay. those POWs uh, were taken care of much better than say uh soviet prisoners of war and uh from what i know some camps not all of them but some camps even would have soviet prisoners of war and western ally prisoners of war in the same camp but they'd be they'd be split up like you know there'd be a fence in between them uh but even in those camps like the difference was was huge because uh because the germans saw the the russians and basically all the slav people as sub subhuman and so right. the some of the, I mean, just the deplorable conditions. Like I can't imagine being in a POW camp. Period. Um, and, yeah. and and experiencing something like this shown in The Great Escape, which I believe is a very accurate movie, uh, would be terrible. Yeah. But it's like the the way they would treat Soviet prisoners of war uh, would just be unimaginably worse. Um, I do have some statistics here that of the five point seven million Soviet prisoners of war, um, three point three of them. Uh, died uh, at some point during captivity, even Holy either either cow. through like deliberate starvation, exposure, or just execution. They would just execute yeah. them right away, and that's that's like fifty seven percent. So fifty seven percent of all Soviet POWs um, died in captivity, and that's compared to um, the numbers I have here. Is for British and U.S. prisoners, there's about two hundred thirty one thousand, which is like such a small number in comparison. And about yeah. 8,000 of, of those died in captivity, which is about 3.6%. So you're looking at 50, you know, Soviet prisoners, 57% yeah. of them died. British and U.S. prisoners, only about 3.5% died. So that, that, that one statistic alone, I, I think, speaks volumes. 
Um, as far as Polish prisoners of war go, uh, I'm not yeah. sure. It sounds like from your research that they were included with the Western allies. Um, so yeah. hopefully things went a little better for them than the, than the Soviets. But uh, Poland did fight for the Soviet Union uh, because a lot of people forget that the Soviet Union invaded Poland at the same time that Nazi Germany invaded them. And so the mm. Soviet Union had their own Polish POWs who they then mm. coerced and sometimes even forced to fight for them. And so those soldiers, if they were captured, I'm sure were treated like Soviet prisoners of war. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, that, that's a lot of information, um, but that's just kind of what I looked up. But as far as the conditions of some of these camps that we're talking about today, I would say it would probably be fairly similar to the Great Escape, where they would have okay. um, some level of uh, leniency, some level of privileges, but it's still not a place you'd want to be. <laughs> Um, <laughs> right now, if you were now if you were a German POW in an American camp, I mean, you had it very easy. <laughs> I mean, there's even stories of them getting to go see the cinema with their guards, and they would get preferential treatment over African American citizens who were trying to right. get in to see a movie. And that's just wild when you start thinking about that about how yeah. much better the Americans treated their German uh, POWs versus how the Germans treated. Americans and Soviets and, and all those. So, you know, speaking of, I live in a town where there was a POW camp. Oh yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> they're all over the place. It's, it's pretty crazy. You don't really think yeah. about them, but yeah, there, there's not much of the site left anymore. It, it's um, basically just a rusty old water tower and there's okay. some baseball fields there now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the one that was here in my town um, was at the very end of the war. So I think it only operated for two or three months. They, yeah. they kind of like threw up some barracks. They had some German POWs here who during the days were sent to work on the local farms <laughs> yeah, as yeah. <laughs> as free labor yeah, for yeah. the for the farmers in our area and and that that's really it after the war i think the barracks were torn down pretty quickly after that but yeah but the water tower is still there oh, um, wow. i i just literally saw it the other day just driving by so <laughs> that's, a, that's a cool piece of history though so yeah but anyway, um, yeah, let's let's take another quick little break because then we're going to get into our next POW Olympics, which I think uh, the conditions there are going to sound a little bit more similar to what you were just describing. But we'll uh, okay. we'll get into that here in just a moment. OK, so let's get into our next POW Olympics, which this one is really probably the most famous of the three and this was the one that initially sparked my interest in maybe doing an episode on it so uh so this is gonna be the uh, waldenberg or voldenberg i guess mm. it's one of those two but this pow camp is a little bit different than Langwasser because it was an oflag not a stalag which means it was specifically for military officers and it was located in Western Poland, and it's now known by another name I'm probably going to butcher, uh, the town of Dobignio. And based on the reports, this particular camp largely followed the rules of the Geneva Convention. And it was known as one of the more fair POW camps run by the Germans. So, yeah, so here's some of the things the prisoners were able to do. They could take and teach classes in subjects like math, which honestly sounds like torture to me, but I'm sure it was great for others. Okay. Uh, <laughs> philosophy, they could learn different languages. Uh, they could even perform plays. Uh, they had a POW orchestra that got together, wow. and they were even allowed to have their own prisoners' government. OK, so those were all things kind of stipulated, again, by the Geneva Convention that they actually followed here. Now, at its height, this camp had 50 barracks, which were able to house up to 7000 prisoners at once. They had six buildings for lecture halls where they would have all those classes. Uh, they had two kitchens and mess halls. They had the theater hall, obviously, for those plays that they were performing they had a cafe and then a prisoner's government building which also doubled as a post office so that they could send letters throughout the camp which 
I know that sounds kind of weird for us, but none of us have been in a POW camp, so I'm sure it just provided them with something to do and to keep up morale. But on top of all of those fantastic amenities, they also had double barbed wire fence, two meters (laughs) wide and two and a half meters high, eight Uh, watchtowers with both light and heavy artillery guns and moving searchlights. So... How yeah, was that way they don't get lost. They always know where they are and they can just right. make sure they don't wander away. Yeah, how how nice of them to have those moving searchlights so mm-hmm. that they can get about safely at night. <laughs> I'm sure that's why they were there. Yeah. <laughs> um so kind of going back to the lecture halls for a second, I thought this was really cool in my research that apparently a good number of the prisoners since they were officers uh were also in their civilian lives, they were professors and academics. Mm. So that's who was actually teaching the classes. And there were actually prisoners while they were at this camp who they got a full fledged university education. Wow. And then their degrees got recognized as official <laughs> after the war was over. So, yeah, I hate to yeah. be the, the person that told them that those credits don't count. They'd be like, we're, we're going to count those for you. Yeah. That's, you, you, went through, you went through all that. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll do that. These don't transfer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Can you imagine that conversation later on? So where'd you go to school? Uh, you know, Waldenburg POW camp yeah. uh, over in Poland. Very it's great. It had some great professors. Had, it had some really great professors. It was more strict than I, I prefer, <laughs> but you know, we learned that. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but I thought that was cool that you had these officers who, you know, were able to get a university education while they were there. So good for them. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so part of the conditions of the camp was probably politically motivated because the Germans wanted to have a better report about their POW camps at this point of the war than the Soviet POW oh, camps, okay, which yeah. had atrocious conditions. Sure. So you know, kind of a weird competition to have, but mm-hmm. it's war, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So at this point, it was kind of one of those things of like, well, if we win the war, we want these officers to have a good opinion of us because we're going to need to find some way to use them afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. But if we lose, we need them to go back to their superiors and say, yeah, we got treated pretty well. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of what's going on here. All that considered, it should still be noted that by the end of the war, at least 10,000 prisoners died during their stay at Waldenburg. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So despite the, you know, better conditions than Langwasser, it still wasn't a cakewalk here. Yeah. So on that note, do you want to hear about some escape attempts? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's chat about that before we get into their Olympics, because there's going to be some overlap here uh, in, in the topic. <laughs> Maybe that so. could be one of their events, you know, is, is tunnel digging or running or something. <laughs> yeah. Climbing, yeah. We're going to climbing. Yeah. We're, we're going to get there in a second. So yeah, <laughs> hold on to that thought. Uh, okay. So, uh, so one of the famous escape attempts here happened in early 1942. There were three officers who escaped the camp by hiding in empty boxes after they had unloaded food supplies from a truck. Wow. Anyway, I just think that's funny that they literally unloaded the food supplies and were like, yoink, jump into the boxes and just got loaded onto the trucks and goodbye. So good for them. (laughs) Uh, Then in that same year, 1942, on Christmas Eve, there was a group of prisoners who got together and they created a diversion by staging a fight outside Mm. one of the prisoner barracks. So... That drew the attention of the guards and, more importantly, of the searchlights. Mm -hmm. That allowed three other officers to cut through the barbed wire fence and escape. So good good teamwork happening there so that those three officers could get out. And obviously, you know, the goal there was for them to be able to take information back, you know, to the allies. So... Then there was also a mass breakout plan, kind of like our uh, great escape uh, movie that we've referenced, which was put together in 1943. So kind of similar to that movie, they were actually digging a huge tunnel 
Um, And unfortunately, their plans were foiled when the tunnel was discovered by guards with just a few feet remaining before it would have reached the end point that they needed to get to. So, yeah, they just needed basically a few more shovelfuls of dirt and and mm. they would have been successful uh but that one ended up failing so yeah despite the uh again slightly better conditions uh again this is one of the things they talk about in the great escape it's like okay our mission here yeah is to basically just try to get out yeah and try to, to get out yeah try to try to use up as much of the enemy's resources as possible to take care of us so that they're not being able to use those resources elsewhere yep a hundred percent. Yeah. So, so yeah. So with that kind of knowledge in the background, let's, uh, let's get into 1944 at the camp and to their Olympic games. So at this point of the war, the international Olympic committee, they had tentatively awarded the 1944 summer Olympics to London in the event that the war ended in time. Oh, Obviously mercy. it didn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Now, London will host the 1948, which we're going to talk about in our next season. Um, And those were fascinating games. I'm going to try not to get ahead of myself because I (laughs) they're one of my favorite games to talk about. But anyway, um, as the war dragged on, obviously that had to get canceled. They just kind of had to wait and see what would happen. So with those games canceled, the prisoners at Woldenberg decided, hey, well, let's just host our own Olympic Games here. And I don't think they had heard about the other <laughs> POW I think games. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of cool to see that these prisoners are having the same thoughts yeah, in absolutely. different places. And another key difference here is that unlike the camp at Langwasser, the prisoners here actually had the approval and support of mm-hmm. the German captors to host these games. Okay. So. Uh, So that gave them a lot more freedom in what they were actually able to put together, which is why these are the ones we know the most. Well, and just an interesting thing thinking about that, because it would depend on who the commandant of that camp was about Mm -hmm. how strict they would be or how not. And I know we talked about the escape attempts at this place, so it's not like no one tried to leave, but you would think that it would be um, to the benefit of the Germans to give the prisoners um, some kind of freedom, um, right. like, like doing the plays and, uh, being in the orchestra, uh, having these, these little gardens that they could tend or, or even holding these games because it keeps them busy. It keeps their minds active right. and they're not going insane thinking, how can I get out of this place, you know, and continue the war. And so you would think that that would be more motivating for a lot of these commandants. And I, I think it was wiser. Now you did mention there was escape attempts and there's always going to be that, but Right. Uh, in some of these other places where it was so much harsher, I don't know. I, I would think it would be even harder to control the 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 prisoners in those conditions, but I could be wrong. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, how, the human spirit can be broken in so many ways, so it's hard to say. But right, that's just an interesting yeah. thought I had. Yeah, no, that's you're you're so right, and that's actually, I mean, that's a really great segue here for for this next little segment uh, that I wanted to get into. So. Uh, So, yeah, let's kind of talk about what they were allowed to do versus what they were not allowed to do. Uh, So I I love this quote that I found a former prisoner, Arkady Virginsky, shared about the opening ceremony uh, during an interview that he did in 2004. So I I think he's passed away since then, but he's still alive back then. So he said the excitement in the entire camp was unbelievable. Mm. All of us were there, some 6,000 men. We were all there together. This was a great moment. And then the Olympic flag went up. The only one in the world just in this spot. Mm. So I think that clues you into, yeah, the morale boost that it was in the permission that they got to be able to do this. They ended up having 464 total competitions held. Wow. (laughs) So that's a lot of events. Um, A lot of events. Uh, And they actually had 369 participants. So that means there were officers who were doubling up, competing in different events. Uh, So the sports that were included that they got permission for were football or what we call soccer here in the States, uh, basketball, which David, I know you're a fan of, 
Yes. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And and the first basketball tournament for the Olympic Games, uh, this was still a very new sport for the Olympics at, the, at this point. That's true. Um, yeah. I wonder I wonder when the first one was for the Olympics. It, you... it was actually in Berlin, 1936. Wow. Oh, very it was, cool. Yeah. We talked about this in our episode. Uh, they held it outdoors on uh, outdoor tennis courts because there was no tennis at those games. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> And the conditions for the final got very muddy because it it rained that day. Oh, so, wow. yeah, it was kind of a, a little bit of a disaster, but still <laughs> it, it made it into the games anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so we got soccer, we got basketball. They were able to do volleyball, uh, handball, which isn't real popular here in the U.S., but it's very popular in Europe. Uh, they got to do athletics or what we call track and field. Um, and then there were several events that they tried to get permission for javelin archery <laughs> and fencing <laughs> man i just can't imagine why those were uh were, were yeah down. yeah obviously the germans were like uh nine nothing that can <laughs> be used as a weapon <laughs> so, so yeah. they tried though um and then uh here kind of gets us back to our uh escape plan topic uh here is uh they also declined the request for pole vault in the <laughs> athletics competition, <laughs> fearing that some of the prisoners would actually try to vault over the fence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, so uh, so they, they X'd that one off the schedule. That's um, amazing. Now, the prisoners had also planned on having boxing, and they did get permission for that, but they ended up having to prematurely end that tournament because... The prisoners were too undernourished to keep fighting. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So they had about half of the scheduled matches, but there were reports of prisoners having to withdraw in the very first round of yeah. the boxing bout. Yeah. They were getting bone fractures from mm. almost nothing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because of malnourishment. So, wow. um, so, so eventually they just decided to shut that competition down over the safety concerns yeah so they did get permission for that one but uh yeah it it could not continue they did some special custom stamps and tickets for prisoners to attend the event oh, cool yeah some of those have actually survived uh i believe those are also in the warsaw museum i had mentioned earlier and they even set up a grandstand uh for the spectators to be able to watch and then there were also some non-athletic competitions included as part of the Olympic program. I think you're going to find this interesting, given your background in art. Um, so the non-athletic competitions included chess, painting, okay. sculpting, and some other arts. I think music was also uh, included in that. So wow. now this may sound weird to you. And it may sound weird to some of our other listeners. So I'm going to give a little reminder to people that that at this time of Olympic history, there had actually been artistic competitions in the summer games since 1912. So it sounds weird to us now, but it wasn't weird back then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So these artistic competitions were overseen by Lieutenant Antoni Grzeszczyk who had been commander of the same company that had included Polish Olympic athlete Janusz Kusaczynski, uh, who had won Olympic gold in the 10,000-meter event at the 1932 Los Angeles Games. So okay. um, now Kusaczynski was not here at the camp, but I, I felt I had to throw this in because we do have an Olympic uh, connection here with that lieutenant uh, okay. saying hey, I had this famous Polish athlete in my unit. I want to be a part of this. <laughs> I yeah. want to. So he wasn't going to participate in the athletics part of it, but uh, he was like, hey, give me the artistic competition. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so here's my question for you, David, especially, you know, being the artist you are, do you think artistic competitions should still be part of the Olympics? <laughs> I mean, that would, that would be wild uh, just because it's not what we're used to in, in, right. you know, in our, in our lifetime, I would be very curious to how they would be judged and, and how the competitions would work. Um, yeah. But there's, there's so many events 
Uh, and and one one thing that I think is so cool, and one of my favorite things about Olympics in general is just when when are there's only those few times during the Olympics where you get to see some of these events. Yeah. And and so you know why not why not have some uh, some artistic ones in there? I think that would be really <laughs> really interesting. Um, I yeah. don't know. I don't know how it would be accepted by uh, by our modern culture, but um, yeah. Well, and you know, eventually that's why they stopped doing it is because judging artistry is so subjective. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and, and you know, someone could make the argument: well, there's a very subjective side of judging things like figure skating sure, and gymnastics, yeah. where yeah, sometimes it comes down to a judge saying, "I, I just think this person looked better." doing yeah. it right so mm -hmm. you know you can make that argument with the artistry involved in some of those sports but you know it may be for the best that they did get cut yeah <laughs> i guess i guess i have to admit that yeah <laughs> yeah but but originally they were included because uh in the ancient greek games there had been an artistic component too the ancient okay. greek olympics were known for being this gathering of greek culture and you would have um, you know, people show up at the at the Olympics to display their art and read poetry and sing songs and uh, and perform plays. And so they were trying the the early Olympic founders were trying to pay homage to that part of the history. Gotcha. But by 19, you know, the late 1940s, early 1950s, our, our culture had kind of moved on from appreciating sure. that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but they were here at the at the Woldenberg uh, game. So I, cool. I think that's just kind of a, a fun little note. But um, let's take another quick little break and then we'll we'll come back and we have a couple other little notes about these games we'll we'll get into. All right, uh, Jonathan, I did have a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, so I know we've talked about the different uh, events that they've had at the PW camps. Um, and you know, we, we even talked about the, the boxers having to kind of quit halfway through because they couldn't physically compete. That makes me wonder, like, were there actually any like former Olympians at these camps, uh, to like present to do these, these events? Were there any from like the 36 games or even like the 32 games? Yeah. So glad that you asked because mm -hmm. yes, there were, and <laughs> this was something really fun for me to discover in this process. So among the 369 participants at the Woldenberg Olympics, there were several bona fide Polish Olympians. So wow. I'm going to introduce you to them. <laughs> that doesn't seem um, fair. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, <laughs> now, I think what you'll see, though, is... Uh, they they may not have had their specific events actually represented oh, okay. at these gotcha. games. So, gotcha. so it may have been a little bit more fair than what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so first up, we have Kazimierz Laskowski, who had won a bronze medal in the Team Sabre event at the Summer Games in oh, Amsterdam okay. 1928. So, you know, as we talked about, they tried to get fencing approval yeah. but uh but that was declined so I i'm sure if they had had al allowed fencing he would have obviously been <laughs> the <Yeah>. clear pick <laughs> well just imagine what a bronze medalist uh, fencer could do to a bunch of uh, german guards if he was given a given a, a foil he'd just go at him <laughs> right <laughs> clear them all yeah. out yeah i mean you know you could maybe make an argument that instead of swords they could have used something like uh yeah i don't know like a, a fishing pole or a, a reed or something yeah, like that but exactly. but anyway so he he did participate and compete but obviously not in his chosen event for the olympics and then this is really fun too we've also got two teammates who were here at the imprisoned together uh vitalis oh, wow. luj and adam kowalski who were part of the ice hockey team which had come in fourth place during the Lake Placid Winter Olympics in 1932. Wow. And they had also competed at the Garmisch Winter Olympics in 1936. So, so David, the Garmisch Games were the other Olympics hosted by Nazi Germany earlier in 1936. So, okay. yeah, so, so they... That was, I guess that was back when they were having Summer and Winter Olympics in the same year, because now they stagger them. 
Yes. Yeah. So back then they still had them in the same year and they um, the way that the system worked was they would award the Summer Olympics. And then if the country hosting the Summer Games also wanted to host the Winter Games, they got preference for that. Okay. If they declined, then the IOC would look for a different host. So when the 1932 Los Angeles Games were awarded, the U.S. said, yes, we will take our option for the Winter Games. And they hosted them at Lake Placid that year. Okay, I see. So, yeah. So anyway, so we've got uh, these two ice hockey teammates who were in prison together. Obviously, they were not <laughs> competing in ice hockey. <laughs> so so again, we're it's all fair here. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think it's kind of fun that among these three, we have representatives of both the summer and winter mm. Olympics participating. So that's that's a really fun fact, yeah, <laughs> if is. you will. But yeah, so in the competitions, winners received two different prizes. They got diplomas and then they also got medals that were made of embossed paper. So okay. those those were their official prizes. And then I read that quote earlier from the prisoner talking about the flag going up. So let's talk about that flag real quick. Um, the Olympic flag from the Waldenburg Games was donated to the Warsaw Museum, just like the other one we talked about. And uh, it was actually donated by uh, Officer Grzechik. So he was the guy who oversaw the artistic competitions we talked about. So, right. um, so he held on to the flag after the games and then 30 years later he donated it to the museum and frankly kind of like the other flag uh it's kind of a miracle that it did survive the end of the sure. war um which we'll talk about how big of a miracle that is here here in a minute but before we talk about that there is one more pow olympics we need to briefly mention so in the same year 1944 there was another pow olympics held at another oflag officers camp known as the gross born camp which was located in germany this one was a lot smaller, and we don't know as much as we know about Voldenberg. Uh, there were only about 3,000 prisoners there. Um, they held their Olympic Games from July 30th to August 15th. It seems like they also had permission from the, their German captors. One story I found was just about their opening ceremony that they held and how they weren't supposed to raise their homemade Olympic flag but they decided to do it anyway. Heck yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and, and I guess the captors were like, yeah, whatever. Like, yeah. just just let it let it mm -hmm. go. But yeah, no, I love that fact that they were told not to raise the Olympic flag because I guess it wasn't supposed to fly since only the Nazi flag was supposed to be flying. But they were just like, screw it. Yeah. We're, we're going to do it anyway yeah. and just see what happens. So mm -hmm. I got to imagine that. Uh that the Germans had the German guards had to be inspired by a lot of this, a lot of the, mm -hmm. these things they were seeing. I mean, even though, cause, cause you, you know, you, you have the true believers, you have the Nazis that are higher up, but a lot of the, yeah. the German soldiers, just the basic German soldiers, they weren't the true believers like that. And so to see people from all over the world, I mean, the Olympics are just inspiring to begin with just to see right. everybody coming together. And so if you're a guard there and you're seeing all these people, under these adverse conditions coming together and doing this, like it's gotta be inspiring. So I'm sure they were like, Hey, you know what? Like, let's just raise that flag. <laughs> yeah. Well, and kind of like I mentioned earlier, like the Germans loved the Olympic games. Yeah. So that's why I think, you know, these guards were more willing to, to let this happen under their watch and, and even, you know, promote it to some degree. Yeah. So, but yeah, unfortunately, we're going to we're going to get into some kind of sadder things here, but it's going to help us understand again why we don't know a ton about these games other than what we've talked about here and yeah. how it's a miracle that some of this information even survived the war as it is. Um, so we're going to fast forward past the games to 1945. OK, so we're getting really close to the end of the war. Yeah. On January 25th, 1945, the Voldenberg prisoners were forced to evacuate the camp because Soviet forces were closing in. 
they were forced by their captors to march for more than 600 miles. Oh my gosh. 600 miles. Yeah. In brutal winter conditions, when the American forces caught up with them in the town of Myrna on April 29th, 1945. So three <laughs> whole months later, yeah. only, only about 300 prisoners had survived at mm. this point out of the thousands. Okay. Yeah. All three of our Polish Olympians did end up surviving the camp. Okay. Uh, so uh, Vitalis, yeah. uh Luja Wichek, and Adam Kowalski, our, our two hockey players, they survived. And uh, Luda Wichek, he went on to become an international law lawyer. And he lived until June 17th, 1988. Uh, so he made, oh, wow. you know, okay. an impact that way. Adam Kowalski actually returned to represent Poland at the St. Moritz Winter Olympics in 1948. So, wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So he, yeah, not only did he, uh, you know, compete before the war, he competed after the war. Not many athletes could say that, yeah. <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Um, and he lived until December 9th, 1971. And then our fencing buddy, Kazmierz uh, Laskowski, uh, he lived until October 20th, 1961. I wasn't really able to dig up a whole lot of information on what he did after the war, but, uh, but he did survive. So we're glad of that, at least. Now, meanwhile, the prisoners over at the Grossborn camp, they suffered a very similar fate. Uh, they were forced to march out of their camp as well on January 28th, 1945. They traveled more than 400 miles to the town of San Bostel. Mm. And most of them, weakened by their years of captivity, died along the way. So yeah. um, it, it sounds like very, very, very few survivors from that camp. So probably why we have so little information okay. about their Olympics. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, you know, it's always kind of a downer to end these stories like this, but it's, you know, it's war. Mm -hmm. So we can't expect always a happy ending, unfortunately. Yeah. But on that note, we do want to talk a little bit about the legacy of these POW games. And so I, I think ultimately, so we can end this on a more positive note, <laughs> you know, the legacy of these games is that they showed what the true Olympic spirit looks like. The yeah. idea that peace is stronger than war and that sports can be a source of hope, of inspiration and of unity. Um, so despite the chaos <laughs> of war, yeah. the fact that you had these prisoners willing to, to do this and to put on these games and to remember, um, something bigger than themselves, I think we can all find a lot of encouragement and hope in that. And then yeah. I, I think also it's a reminder for us of the price of freedom for those of mm. us who have not faced war firsthand. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, if you are listening to this today and you have a kid who plays a sport or you enjoy a sport yourself, you you run or you bike or whatever it is, or you just enjoy watching sports on TV, you know what? Take the time to make sure you thank a veteran <laughs> for their mm -hmm. sacrifice to make that activity possible for you. And I think that's something we can take away from these games and remember. So, um, so yeah, but, uh, but yeah, David, I, I didn't prep you for this question. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of awesome. do this to Sarah all the time. I, I, <laughs> I give her all this preparation and I always say, I'm not going to surprise her with questions and I do, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, just kind of tell me like, what are, what are your thoughts hearing these stories? Um, uh, you know, you're not, a, a rabid Olympics fan like I am, but, <laughs> but you do like them and you few, love few history. Are, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what do you take away from these stories? I think my, my takeaway is, um, you know, so many times, like I know in my life, you know, things happen and I feel sorry for myself or I think, you know, I'm going through something difficult or something hard. Um, and maybe it keeps, 
I lose a lot of faith in maybe what, what God's doing in my life, or I lose a lot of faith in like maybe my family or in myself. Mm -hmm. And then I hear stories like this and it's like, like the things that I go through, like are nothing in comparison to what some people go through. Um, and I'm not just talking about soldiers, uh, but, you know, just, just people that are, you know, maybe either less fortunate than I am or, uh, you know, live in a different country or whatever the case may be. Um, but it's, it's just really inspiring to think of like the conditions that these guys were in, you know, being in yeah. war would be uh, an experience all into itself. You know, I've never, I've never served, so I've never been in combat before. Um, even yeah. though I really enjoy reenacting and I enjoy learning about the experience of other uh, people that did, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't even compare uh, to what they've been through, obviously. Uh, so to go through that, to become a prisoner of war, which I think would be truly horrifying because you don't know, like your life from that moment on is hanging by a thread. It's in someone else's hands. You know, if you surrender, yeah. um, you don't know if they're just going to shoot you because they don't want to deal with it or right. what's going to happen in your, you, you have no way to contact your, your family or your friends or anyone, even if, even if you're in a camp where the conditions are better, it's still, you're, you're a prisoner and it's yeah. not in like a, a state regulated prison. It's in this, I mean, there's soldiers in control of you. And so they're going to do whatever they want. Um, yeah. Because it's wartime and there's, you know, you could have rules, but they kind of break down in, in wartime. Uh, so you're in these conditions and yet there's still, you always hear, whenever you hear these, these people in these situations, the camaraderie that they always have um, and how much they care for each other. Uh, and it's something that doesn't really translate as well in like the civilian world, I don't think, um, yeah. because people don't understand that brotherhood. Uh, anytime I hear a veteran talk about their experience, either in war or in combat, it's like you care about the people that are next to you. That's what I hear them say all the time, over mm. and over and over again. Um, and so you, I think you really see that in what we've been talking about this evening is even through all this adversity and through all the things that they've been through, like, I just want to like, just give up, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do anything, but they, these guys yeah. are like inspired to band together, um, to keep this, uh, this flame of like competition and brotherhood, um, and sportsmanship going even during the darkest of times. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I mean, I, I know I, it's kind of a cliche, but I'm just, I'm just inspired by that kind of stuff because I think of what would I be doing in those similar situations? And it's hard to say what I would be doing, but uh, that's what these guys were doing. And it's just really cool to see um, how they still banded together and unified. Cause a lot of these guys, even though their countries were allied to each other, you know, they were all from different countries. They all spoke different languages, especially like the camp that had like the Norwegians and Belgians and the Dutch yeah, and the British. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you got to think like how much did they have in common? Well, they found these Olympics are what they had in common, you know, and they, they were able to kind of come together and do that together. And so I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, no, that's yeah. All really good points. So, and you know, and we I'll throw this in here too. I didn't have it in my notes, but something we talked about, I believe in one of our 1936 episodes was you know, kind of the long lasting power of the Olympics, that there's this story of an Olympic athlete who became a soldier and another Olympic athlete, a German uh, Olympic athlete was uh, captured. Um, he was ordered to execute the German Olympic athlete. He recognized him as a really? fellow Olympian and he disobeyed orders and refused to wow. kill him because yeah of the bond that yeah, no, we're both, we're both Olympians mm -hmm. and, and I, I won't do it because the Olympics stand for peace. Yeah. So, yeah. So even that, like this person who's supposed to be your enemy and you, mm -hmm. you find camaraderie through this bond yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. is, is really powerful. But that anyway, is. yeah. Um, I know this was a bit of a departure from our normal episode. That's okay. It, it's fun to shake it up every now and then. Um, and I wanted to make sure to get something out before we come back for season three. Um, but yeah, David, thanks so much for doing this and for filling in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, it was a ton of fun. And do you still, do you still do, do you still run World War Wednesday? I do. Yes. Uh, okay. yeah, it's on, it's on Facebook. Um, if yes. you just go to facebook.com slash World War Wednesday. Um, yeah. 
it's I guess it's been a few weeks since I've updated it, but um, it's got like over 80 um, different countries. Like I do the different uniforms and equipment, yeah, uh, helmet, weapon for 80 different countries. So it, it I do it kind of to show like just how global World War II was. Like pretty much right. every country in the world was involved on some level. Um, right. Even if their policy was neutrality, like they were still affected in, in big ways. So yeah, I like yeah. that show. But it, it's very global, much like the Olympics. It's very, it's a very global war, and every country is involved in some ways. So. Yeah. So I'll put the link for that in the show notes for oh, our cool. listeners who maybe want to go check out some of your uh, very detailed <laughs> <laughs> it <is quite> uniforms <laughs> <detailed>. <laughs> that you reenact. Um, I, I think there's some people who will enjoy that. But cool. um, I'm going to try to get another. Uh, bonus episode out while Sarah is uh, taking a break and bonding with baby at home. Um, I, I promise if I do get another bonus out, it's going to be a more fun topic than this one. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll do something a little bit lighter, <laughs> but, but you know, we'll uh, we'll kind of see how things are are going with with Sarah and when she's ready to come back. So you should you should do a bonus episode on the office and how Flonkerton has changed uh, has changed the <laughs> has game. changed the game forever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, so um, so yeah, that's kind of a wrap on the pow games and until next time odyssey you later the games odyssey podcast is a production of wardrobe media llc this episode was written hosted produced and edited by jonathan jordan and co-hosted by sarah Patton. show notes including research sources and transcripts can be found on our website gamesodyssey.com Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content feature in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.